today we have the target evaporator exit temperature and what I did was I took a wide array of data and plotted out different targets from many different situations and what I used I used temperature in the room from 68 to 80 degrees because that's going to be the most common and that sort of fits in the area where you have you know the I manifold won't calculate airflow but within a certain range and I can understand why that is now after you know probing into this data it's because beyond that range things get a little things get a little bit strange so you keep it in this range it'll be more accurate and the rule of thumb will work a whole lot better now what I found that the biggest factor in determining the rule of thumb will be the relative humidity in the air not so much the temperature although the temperature does matter as it goes up and down, temperature will affect the split, but the major thing affecting the split is how much water is in the air. Because that's going to dictate uh, the split between sensible and latent cooling, how much latent cooling is going to be required. And the more humidity in the air, the more energy is going to be put into wringing the humidity out of the air meaning our temperature split, our sensible cooling is going to go down because it's going to have more focus on the latent side, which is the dehumidification. So I'm going to set it up, and I'm going to show you on the screen here in a second. And I'm going to go ahead and bring that up, and we see a target evaporator exit temperature rule of thumb. Standard evaporator is what I wrote. I'm still working on fine-tuning it, but this is going to work for most situations. We're going to range from 40% relative humidity to 80% relative humidity. Now 80 is on the top end. 80 is a very saturated, very saturated air, uh, a volume of air, which you're not going to see very often. I do see them up into the 70s sometimes, whenever the system has been down or it's a new house or something like that. And guys like in the desert areas, guys like Vegas, guys in Phoenix might see more of the 40% relative humidity or maybe even lower than that. So what we see is we have a 40% relative humidity. We're going to have a target around 21 degrees. Now this will fluctuate a little bit, but if you use this as a base point to gauge um, what you have coming through the machine, it's going to be fairly accurate. Because if you think about it, even if you're using other tools like the I manifold, you're using other tools to measure temperature split, it's still going to be contingent upon where you put it and how accurate your practices of measuring the temperature are. If you're not accurate with it, you won't get an accurate measurement back. And since no one's going to be 100% accurate, a rule of thumb with some guesswork involved to it, meaning that you're not going to, you're not going to calculate it exactly, you're going to use a rule of thumb to a certain degree everything has some uncertainty because there's error in measurement. So I'll put it to you that the rule of thumb will be pretty close to getting you in the right ballpark even compared with your measurements. So let's start with 40% relative humidity. It's 21 degree split. And this is just brought over a wide array of data I put together. 50% relative humidity around 19 degrees. So if you were to come in and say well it's 50% or it's 53% and I have 18, you say, well, that looks pretty good because you're kind of, you're going to plot a sort of imaginary median in between 50 and 60%, and you'll say, well, 18's right in between the two because 60% is 17 degrees. Now, if you move up to 70%, you go to 14 degrees. And it starts to drop off a little bit quicker because you have so much latent energy in the air to take out. It's really dropping your temperature split down and you get to 80% and you're around 12 and guys if you think about it if you go up into the 80s in temperature you're going to be at the lower end of the scale so if you had a 70% relative humidity with 85 degree return air you would probably be on the lower end of the scale so if you had 12 or 13 degree split you wouldn't be alarmed because as the temperature goes up it's going to push that scale downward just slightly but under normal circumstances, just think about it, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 21, 19, 17, 14, 12. Usually, you have a set number that you have to remember. Let's say that you're one of the guys like me who are in a 
warm climate, a humid climate, and you're never going to use the 40%. I mean, ever. I mean, I, I, I'm never going to use the 40%. The only reason I put 40% in is because I saw some of the data, I think, from Vegas's iManifold reports, which had a very low humidity. So I wanted to add that in there for that aspect of the people in that part of the country. So we have, or I would be using, typically 50, 60, and 70%. So 19, 17, 14. It's pretty easy to remember. You don't have to drag around a bunch of calculators and paper. You can remember this. Go to your job site say, well, I just hooked up a machine. I had some 74 degree return air and the humidity was 65%. So I know the 60 is 17 and 70 is 14. So if I'm right in the middle, I'd say about 15 and a half. But my air is coming out 19 degrees. So I can say, well, I have a return or a an airflow issue. Whereas if you, if back in the day if I would have started a machine that had 19 degrees I'd be like man this thing is really cooling. She's working great. Armed with this information you can say well that's not right. I have low airflow. I need to change the blower speed or I need to see what's going on with the duct work or whatever. Is the coil dirty along those lines? Does the filter look like cat hair? Is coating it? So that's pretty much it guys. It's something I worked on for a while. A target exit evaporator temperature rule of thumb. I checked over it a couple of times. I put the data together. I sort of averaged it out. I found that the best way to do it is by relative humidity. So just have something that measures relative humidity. The field piece pin, the pin, little PRH, I want to say it's PRH2. Anything that can measure relative humidity. And you know, if you have the SRH3 or SRH2, it can do the target evaporator temperature on its own. So you won't need to remember anything. And a lot of guys will have something to do target evaporator temperature. But if you want to, like say you want to whip out the smart tool and measure the return temperature with your pen style uh, like PRH2, and then you want to know what your target will be so you don't have to drag out the I-manifold, this will work for you. Real simple. You can even have two of those little pen style deals, stick them in both the registers, and you'll be good to go. Might save a little bit of time. You can use it for what it's worth, or you can just use it just to you know, if you have guys talking to you that work in your company, it's like, I have this temperature split, does it sound right? You can be like, yep, sounds good to me. Talon said so. That's pretty much it, guys. That's target, evaporator exit temperature rule of thumb. We're going to get into a lot more, but we got to lay the groundwork for it. Psychometric chart, like I said, it's a learning process for me as well. I've got, I've got into it somewhat. As I get farther into it, I'll feed you that knowledge as best I can. We're going to talk about what enthalpy is. That's probably our next thing. Will be some of the term, uh, some of the designations on the psychometric chart, what they mean, and what they mean to us. How we can use it in our everyday lives, not just in a laboratory. Try to make it useful information in the field, because that chart teaches you a lot of stuff. And plotting a few lines on a chart will tell you a lot about what the system's doing, just from the angle of the lines. So. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you on the next one.